Uh, we'll move on to the, to the presentations um, from the four uh, facilitators of the four groups, which is leading us on from the last meeting, um, where we're looking at some more concrete actions and, and suggestions going forward. Um, so I just ask the four facilitators if we can keep this fairly short and sweet, um, uh, that it will be it's a continuous process that we'll be engaging with anyway online, um, and, and time is slightly running against us today, so um, we want to have some time at the end as well for a discussion about how we actually move that process forward between now and September and also well beyond September. So I think, uh, Imelda, you've, uh, looks like you, your chart is already up there, so we'll ask you maybe to present first. Imelda was uh, facilitating the accountability group. Thanks, Thank you. Um, well, we had a very interesting discussion um, uh, because, it, it, again, um, some of the issues that we looked at, we actually parked on the basis that they were more appropriate for another group. Um, in particular, public education was something that we considered to be very important accountability, to put more suitable for the citizens' participation group. And also, we had two challenges over there, um, no public engagement in legislation and consultation to NARA, which we also thought would be more appropriate for civic um, participation group. Um, we identified five priorities, um, and then went through those priorities depending on how many people had identified them as priorities. Um, the first one we started with was core financial oversight, then moved to best practice on standards, um, on accountability standards, and then weak accountability institutions, lack of clear legislative framework, and finally legal costs as a deterrent to accountability. Insofar as poor financial oversight is concerned, we largely focused on the role of the Comptroller and Auditor General in reviewing um, financial waste within departments. Um, there's a strong view that there's a need for more accountability, um, and firstly that those reviews should take place more real time rather than after the fact. So there should be ongoing monitoring. Um, in addition, sanctions for excessive waste should be real. Um, and these could include dismissal, but also that those found to have waste within their department should be red circled and sub subject to enhanced scrutiny then over subsequent years. Um, in addition, we felt it important that sanctions be seen. Um, for, for currently, for example, uh, the public service obtain increments, and they can lose those increments because of poor performance, and we felt it would be important for the public to know when increments are lost for performance related problems. <coughs> um, and similarly, we felt that the uh, results, or the, the cases heard by the Public Service Disciplinary Tribunal should be publicly available, um, because there's a perception that's not that, that nothing is done, um, that public servants lack accountability, or this perception might not be completely true, but without the information, there's no way of knowing that. Um, on the point of best practice standards, some of the uh, su suggested action points include si signing up to the um, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, implementing the tribunal recommendations, and also implementing Article 6 and 13 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Um, Article 6 basically emphasizes the need for a preventative uh, institution for uh, promoting integrity. And Article 13 is concerned with civil society involvement. Another recommend, uh, action point was ratification of the uh, Council of Europe Civil Court Law Convention. The next point then was the weak accountability institutions. Uh, possible action points include um, the proposed planning regul regulator should report to the Oireachtas rather than any individual minister. We should call for the establishment of an independent commission against corruption. Um, complaint procedures before accountability bodies should be less formalised and there should be more use of anonymous complaint procedures. Um, accountability institutions should be able to have specialised staff, um, referring in particular to institutions within the public service itself. Um, there is a need for increased facilitation of interagency cooperation. Uh, we need a legislative basis for imposing corporate criminal liability and we need more training. Um, the next point then was the clear legislative framework, and here we basically focused on um, recommending that legislation have a legislative impact assessment. So when the bill is published, it should be accompanied by a legislative impact <coughs> assessment, explaining the impact of that bill for other legislation. Um, and in addition, uh, the 
Iraq's website should indicate commencement dates. But there are other issues raised here regarding the linkage between bills and acts that are going to be amended by the bill, and linkage between acts, for example, and uh, amending legislation, and for example, the Law Reform Commission. But we felt that the transparency group might be more appropriate to deal with those issues or the technology group. And then finally, on the issue of costs, um, one, the proposal here was that consideration should be given to having a preliminary proceeding in um, public interest cases where judges can decide initially whether or not there's a public interest point and then decide on costs at that point rather than at the end of the trial. Um, so that where somebody's interested in bringing public interest litigation, they know what the likely cost implications before they, they, they bring the case. So that's where we got to today. Um, so thank you for listening and thank you to the group. Thanks very much. Uh, before we move on, we, we're going to take the questions and discussion all together at the end, so we, we won't take questions now. We're just, is there anyone from the accountability group that would want to add anything to that before we move on? Will we do that with each of the groups in case anything gets commanded you left out? No? Excellent. Okay. Uh, Sarah, are you um, okay to present on the transparency uh, work group? searchable data. Uh, so the first kind of actionable point that we had on that was uh, to have more data visualization tools um, around government information, you know, graphics and filters that allow individuals to easily um, compare and uh, see um, different, uh, you know, different uh, breakdowns of government information. Specifically on the budget, so John from the Department of Public Expenditure spoke about how a steering committee has been appointed um, on, on the kind of, on the by the IMF to um, to to further uh, break down budget information because at the moment it's very it's very uh, high level and um, so you know hopefully there's no time on it for the next couple of years there should be um, more more information about subgroups and exact venture and um, also more comprehensive data banks so more data available um, and again this comes up with the budgetary subheadings as well. Another interesting point that was raised here um, was specific to local authorities, which was uh, discussed later on, but still relevant here as well, is that uh, there should be more, uh, there should be records of meetings, um, specifically meetings where decisions are made at the local level. Like these meetings are kept uh, for national meetings, but uh, not for, for local authorities from the experience of the group, um, and justification for the decisions made in these meetings as well. The second thing uh, we discussed was official data is not user friendly, and the kind of the, pro the proposals that came from that was that uh, the government release uh, the raw data, which is easily filtered and easily uh, and easily uh, visualized by citizens, but that it was the role of civil society to uh, manipulate this data into different interpretations. And um, also that it, that the um, that each you know any online platform requests feedback. Um, and that this feedback is used to, uh, you know, to improve or to direct the service, uh, so this can be done by research and analytics. Um, thirdly, then, uh, where do I begin? Um, so that was that was another challenge that we that we discussed, um, and that we proposed that there should be a data audit taken, so info information from all uh, all the public uh, all the public departments on what exact data they had, uh, what format was in, and to commit to. Um, to releasing it in a certain standard, so once they realised what information they had, that it was um, brought up to the appropriate standard, so machine readable, um, and that then it was subsequently um, released and kind of detailed as to what exactly each department uh, deals with, and um, and so citizens can know where exactly to get the information they need. I'm just going to change the issue. So um, we spoke about the lack of coordination between different uh, IT systems and different departments. So it was proposed that, first of all, that um, each system and each process within each department is simplified and then automated and then hopefully in the future uh, integrated. This was 
considered a more long-term goal, those that would require um, one set of standards and uh, across all the partners who use radically different and uh, in, in not cohesive uh, systems. So it was recognised that might be beyond the, the two-year mandate of the action plan. Lastly, then, we spoke about FOI requests. Uh, there's a disagreement among the group as to uh, whether or not fees should be charged for, for FOI or not. Um, but it was agreed that um, the FOI bill should be scrutinised by and, and compared to uh, OGP standards as to whether or not it was uh, appropriate. Also, a higher penalty for destroying documents under the current uh, draft of the bill is uh, 4,000 euros uh, for. Um, to destroy a bill, which is, is not a lot of money uh, for somebody that really wants to destroy a bill, so, or destroy a document, sorry. Um, so then lastly on the FOI as well, that um, the legal professional privilege should be reviewed as well. But again, that all falls under scrutinising the, the FOI bill. So that's what we discussed uh, in summary now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks to the group members there. If anyone from the transparency group wants to or wish to add to it, wish to add to anything that Sarah has summarised there. No, great. And um, all right, and um, we go to Jeremy. Um, yes. Here. Yeah. Jeremy is going to be presenting from the civic or citizen participation group. So just context first, I suppose, um, um, thanks to, we have, we're very lucky to have three of civil servants participate in our group, and thanks to them for their engagement as well as to the, to the group itself. Um, um, what we've been asking the feedback to identify, uh, narrow down four solution areas to focus on, and then to feedback on, on six, six, of the, um, six of the action points. So we won't be covering everything that we covered in the group, and in a really in a non-democratic way, I've selected ones that I felt the energy was. There's a lot more points that, will, that, are, that, are, going, that are coming through anyway. It's just a flavour of some of the action points that came through. Um, the four uh, solution areas and the ones that we came in with, we are in four, so we didn't have to put that prioritisation process. They are fostering active citizenship, returning power to local level, uh, putting people before the economy and um, bringing uh, bridging the digital divide. And I've selected six here. Uh, most of our discussion, mostly uh, uh, centered on the first area, mostly due to really poor facilitation skills that might be offered, and also uh, there was there was more energy in that area as well. So that is where the the the, the lion's share of, of energy was as well. And so um, some of the um, suggested action points that we're, we're bringing forward is. Um, I'll start with the second one first. This is around the um, lowering the voting age to 16. This is something that's been through the Constitutional Convention. But you may ask, why, why put that in the OGP arena? The feeling in the group was that if this is at a tipping point, it could very easily fall off um, the radar. And that to have it, um, to have it in effect seconded, or to have the shoulder put the wheel from the OGP side, could be the difference between this becoming a reality or not. So. You know, there was a question around is it ambitious enough, but if, it's, if it could be the difference between it happening or not, then it's something that we're, we're suggesting and, and that, that be brought forward. Um, a line of that is our, the, the first um, uh, suggested action point, which is the reform of CSPE. It's something I mentioned at the start of the day. Uh, the day. This is the, the junior shirt cycle, the uh, civic, social, and um, political education. I think that's, that's okay. And there is a, an opportunity, again, this is an opportunity, there's a moment where there's an opportunity to reform here at the moment in terms of the, the outputs of these programs. Okay, no, it's not going to change um, active citizenship um, across the board, but there is, there is a, an opportunity there for you know, there's a time, there's a moment, and we, there could be change in terms of the, the, the educational content. And the, the focus there is around um, what we heard from in the group is that at the moment it's a very passive engagement and that there could be real ways of making that a lot more active and engaged and opening people their eyes at a very early stage in the development to um, more engaged ways of particip particip participation. So that was a number of suggestions. There were, I'll put it, there's a caveat as well. Um, there was some concerns around um, uh, 
around Donald's reproach in terms of the, the amount of um, that there are other concerns at that level around literacy and numeracy. Um, so again, these are just suggested action points. Also, we recognise in the group, and I see you all nodding with me now, is that we've still got a lot of work to do online in terms of um, shaping up some of these action points as well, ensuring that they're really smart goals. So we've all committed, haven't we, to, uh, <laughs> to engage you on this for the next couple of weeks. So um, uh, let's see, uh, where am I? Uh, just on the third point, there, there are other action points which I'm not referencing here, but also spoke to that need to generate um, um, more active um, citizenship or encourage um, um, uh, engagement by, by citizens. But this third one speaks to the other side of the coin, which is around um, uh, training for, for civil servants uh, around local government protection uh, um, participation. Um, we've identified the acronym uh, PMDS, which means something to me, but it's apparently the equivalent of, um, of continuous professional development as a potential entry point there. Um, and um, the dolls shake his head at me saying they're not the same thing. We have some homework to do in terms of seeing where the appropriate um, um, action point is there. But we have some very good input um, from the British experience around that. It, um, it's, it's similar, um, it echoes one of their, um, their action points. And we have to do a little bit more work on that one to see um, whether we can sharpen it up into a really viable um, action point. So more work needed. Um, we had a very strong recommendation then around direct democracy. This is something I think there was, there was strong um, support for this within the group. And this is around um, you reach a certain proportion of the population, you get a referendum on key issues. At, the, at, at our group, what was mentioned was that 1% um, population should be enough for a referendum on legislative issues and 2% for um, anything on the constitution. And what was mentioned here, this should be used as an effort to propose or uh, propose or propose change. And um, so I hope I'm doing that, that point of justice, that again, that's speaking to, to bringing some of that power down, you know, away from these centralized stru structures. Um, so that was our, our fourth suggestion. Um, uh, again, we're, we're looking at using, there was a, another suggestion around um, using the Constitution Convention around, uh, to ensure a commitment to sustainability in the Constitution. So, um, again, what we're looking at there is, is uh, an, an obligation to seek to hand on to future generations a sustainable environment. So, um, that's, that's, that's another um, suggestion that's coming through our group uh, as an action point. Um, and finally, we also recognise that there's this opportunity at the moment um, to incorporate some of the OGP process at local level. Um, we, we have, I think we still have more work to do on that one as well in terms of um, shaping that up where the opportunity exists. At the moment there is a lot of government reform. Um, we've been told by um, um, we were, we were the civil service that there, there, there is an opportunity in the, in the time frame to engage in that. I think we have some homework to do in that to see where best to, to interact with that. So we have some, some um, suggested action points. We also have some more work to do uh, and some homework. So um, that's, that's the, the feedback from my group. Thanks very much, Dermot. Um, anyone from the citizen participation group I want to add to Dermot's uh, uh, Donald? Yeah, please, yeah. I'm very interested in the initiative. I just want to correct something. Um, on citizens' initiative, I think I was the one who spoke on the percentage. The percentage should be of the previous, the total ballot poll in the previous election, and just general election. And I just as an example, I didn't mention this, but just an example, the population in the last election was about four and a half million people. The total ballot poll was uh, about half that, 2.2. So, I mean, there's a huge difference amount of signatures one would have to collect. And I, I, the reason I use total ballot poll is that that is the basis on which we govern ourselves. So the, the turnout and that forms the basis of legitimate government. And if we tie it to that, we're tying it back to an established basis of legitimacy and the exercise of our power through mechanisms, through the organisms of state. 
So I think it's just that I regard the difference as significant. And therefore, you hope you don't mind my mention. Thanks, Don. Thanks for that uh, extra, extra information and clarification. Um, John, yeah? Yeah, I just wonder whether the group discussed international standards of best practice in citizen participation. Uh, I know the OECD has some guidance on this. I just wonder whether it was referred to during the, the discussion. No. <laughs> no, it didn't come up, but um, I, I discussed it was very wide ranging. Um, and as I say, I think I still think we need to, we need some refining work to be done, to work to be done, and um, hopefully there'll be more engagement online and we can feed in some important resource documents like that. Thank you. I'm not to worry, Gary, because we discussed it anyway in the accountability group. Very good. Uh, last but not least, um, the technology and innovation group. Uh, John is going to give us the summary there. John, you're on time. We'll do this from the back because we made all that up, so then we can do uh, this one around. We'll do this reasonably, reasonably quickly and in exactly the reverse order to the way we did it in the first place. Um, because all of the, the vast majority of the uh, discussion was in the first block. There were, we have a couple of issues, and I'd quite like Ross to come and join me in a second to, to fully explain and do justice to one of his actual words. Um, we have a couple of things that didn't fit to any of our pre-set topics, um, one of which related to um, voter registration, which we don't think should be an entirely manual paper-based process anymore. Um, we covered it as part because we were talking about tech and innovation, it didn't come, into, it come under uh, any of our own um, main themes. I also suspect quite strongly that there are parts of the Department of the Environment that's already involved in this um, that we might not have to use up one of our slots in the OGP by talking about it. Um, we, I'm going to pass to Ross for just one second to explain this general website thing. Yeah, so we have a point, um, it's not very smart, um, it might be clever, but uh, create a website, strong app that engages people and explains the work of government. So maybe something like government, Facebook. Um, uh, I thought maybe the citizen participation is might have kind of come into that. I think it's probably been a crossover on them. Um, but it's technology, it's open. Um, there's lots of things the government do, no idea what they're doing. In the UK, they're creating a, um, an app and a website that's, central, that's one central resource for all government information. Um, why don't we have that? And not just in I don't mean to dismiss the brilliant work the government does and uh, so many things, but often information is quite fat and not very engaging. Um, they don't really feel, it doesn't really seem like they're trying to engage us, so like, get the user experience experts in there, get them um, to make something that people want to engage with, that they can customise to their own use, and, um, and hopefully we can create a, 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 an idea or a suggestion that's a little smarter than that, so we can give them some uh, specifics and Thank you. Right, so apart from that, we've got three broad themes. Um, the first of which was a discussion about how we improve open data relating to local government. And we have one concrete proposal here, which is we would like for possibly the Department of the Environment, or if not them, some other more suitable to see, to define a standard list of data sets which all local government entities should be producing. Which, to avoid the situation where we have a thing where Fingal has a data portal with 50-something sets and the 50-something sets are replicated. Not one of those 50-something sets is replicated by all other local authorities. The way to do this, if you want to use open data, you need, to, you need that open data to be available nationally even though it's currently being produced by 34 different entities. We need a standardised list of what local government organisations should be producing and we need them to be mandated to produce it. Um, that also goes for the format in which it arises. We have another area over here, um, raising awareness of open data, its opportunities, its potential revenue among innovators and others. Um, if that sounds long-winded, it's because two of our points were broadly identical, we merged them. Um, we would like specifically to urge, we don't know exactly what part of the state, to spend money 
in an undefined manner, um, of, of an undefined amount, but, it, but because it's, uh, we're talking about marketing promotion. We, there, are, there are benefits both to the economy and to efficiency in government itself related to the use of open data. All of the, I bored you for five minutes about this earlier on today. Um, we would like that raising awareness to be to, to have some money behind it in terms of the government. The UK has, uh, has a website that promotes using government data to uh, start the business. Um, to uh, direct people towards uh, open data competitions and app funds. It's the local enterprise boards that might be able to help you with your ideas and, and you know, mentors who can help you with your fabulous idea and find local developers and all that sort of stuff. But the, these things, people, even after this morning, people are still talking about producing open data as a cost, um, as we discussed earlier on. That need not be the case. And promoting the use of open data in commerce um, and among other things, creating jobs and, and tax revenue as a consequence of all that extra economic activity is how publishing open data and making the government more transparent in general is not a cost but a benefit to the state. Um, around about this point, we, like, we restated a principle that quality assurance for data um, should not inhibit the initial release of that data. Um, we don't have an answer specifically to the question of how you get from slightly mucky data to more reliable data later on. Um, but as a general as a general principle, we would like time we would like data to be available early more than we would like it to be perfect. Um, there is a discussion with a semi-concrete idea that um, in general public procurement um, Perhaps, in, especially when it comes to large IT projects or things that the government hasn't done before, I mean, the people who are starting government tenders may not really have the best idea of what they should be buying. And asking the people who might be supplying the thing that they buy in the end might not be the ideal people to ask. Um, perhaps we should find some way of facilitating conversation between civil service and experts in general, not necessarily us, but not necessarily excluding us either, um, so as to assist with that in some way that has not yet been fully specified. But the bulk of our efforts um, came into that large thing at the top, which was improving our baseline data um, to identify what data sets exist. This came up a little while ago in the transparency group you just heard, um, and that data should be published in relatively standardized formats. Um, we have six cards on that board. Um, some of these are probably to be merged into single action points for later on, but we would like all data published by the government to be published in machine readable and non proprietary formats. Some of us, in particular, would like us to concentrate on releasing data which is releasable. Um, which relates specifically to, to our ability to track the outcomes of public services. We would like baseline spatial data to be available as soon as possible. So all those boundaries we were talking about earlier on, um, postcodes, which we're yet to get, which, are, which will probably, which at the moment we have no expectation will be open in any way. Um, it's been pointed out among, within the group that there is a move potentially afoot for the OSI to do a general national mapping agreement with the state and ditch its slightly silly trading fund with all of its massive overheads would be enormously in favour of that if that's true um, and this would be achievable within such a context. Um, we'd like, again this came up in transparency group earlier on, we would like that audit by per department and per organisation within the state of what data sets are available. We call it a stock take. Um, and, uh, an idea that, has, uh, that came up last time and didn't get addressed very much today was we could make that grand open data catalogue of all those things, the, the full stock take <coughs> containing only the metadata of the data. We can describe what data sets exist in a large catalogue before we are able actually to populate the data attached to each one of those metadata records. Sorry if I'm using the data and metadata in a confusing manner. Um, for, those of us, for those of us here who are massive nerds. And um, we would like budget data to be published in that more granular format specified a little while ago. Um, we would like specifically for it to be linked with spending data and with contract values 
and contract outcomes because as we again mentioned earlier on there's budget data and there's outcome data those things need to be connected to each other um, connected to that we've also um, have a an opinion in favor of a general publication threshold for government spending above a certain level um, which level would be different at different levels of government we don't specify a number we're open to suggestions and further discussion on those points that's pretty much all i've got um, except if anybody in the tech room thinks i've missed something substantial out please jump in at this point great john thanks for that, that was very comment anyone on the group uh peter yes and um, yeah. um, yeah. yeah. I would also suggest that it would be a little bit technical and a little bit innovatory to suggest that elected chambers should be using electronic multi option voting so that we could have not only their opinions but also their preferences on any consultations and so on. Great. Peter, thanks very much. Anyone else there? Um, okay. Well, listen, first of all, thanks everyone. Oh. John, yeah. Sorry, I do have those separately. This is a completely different point that we're going to um, ask me to bring up at some point towards the end of this. Um, we're stepping away from this group for momentarily. Um, we're engaged in a, in a process whereby TI is facilitating this consultation. Um, and we'll get to a point where we come up with our suggestions for what's going for what we think should go into the National Action Plan. But by that time, our conveners will no longer be under contract to provide that service. So we find ourselves towards December and when we come to the end of this process at the end of the year um, with us having produced a list of things we want and people in, um, in the Irish government who are prepared to talk to us about how we take two lists and make them into a national action plan and we would uh, like us to start thinking about, if not actually immediately discussing, who among us will be sitting opposite the person from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform when that time comes. Because we want, we're not an organisation and we need, to, we need to start thinking about creating a much larger, more representative ad hoc organisation than the one that was kicking around before we had a person in the Thanks for that, John. That's an important uh, suggestion and an important point to make. And um, it's one of the things that we want to maybe throw up in there before we wrap up today. But first of all, I just say, I think it's uh, having attended the first meeting, um, uh, I've been involved in the process for the last few few, few weeks and that it's, it's very encouraging to see the progress we've made from, from last last month where we were starting from scratch uh, as, as, as this collective group to, uh, to where we've come today. I mean, there's an enormous amount of uh, ideas generated and an enormous amount of energy um, and like you mentioned Germany, certain ideas uh, generate more energy and more enthusiasm and uh, there's a lot of cross-cutting issues as well being popping up in, 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 in across the four groups. Um, so I think we've made huge progress uh, as, a, as, a, as a group of you know, individuals and a group of organisations and a civil society, so that's very encouraging. So we will certainly be just asking uh, to keep this momentum going all the way through to the conclusion of this part of the process, bearing in mind this is just a, a part of a much longer term process that we, we, we want people to be continually engaged in. So I want to throw that out to the floor uh, in relation to basically how do we uh, continue to engage with the process? Uh, how do we ensure that momentum and um, your thoughts on that? I think Nuala had requested as well that maybe if we, if we can put down our thoughts on one thought or one suggestion on, on those index cards, if we can get them distributed, maybe if people haven't done it already, just so we have it for record. We, we do want to discuss it. How do we as a civil society individuals, one, engage with the process, continue to engage with it between now and September 5th and then again December, the John race, but uh, equally, uh, the departments as well, particularly the department who's sort of leading this process, public expenditure and reform, are particularly interested in how we, as a civil society individuals, engage with the process continually. Because really, we're only, once the action plan is in place, that's just the beginning. Um, so I'm just going to try it open at the moment uh, to the floor. If anyone has any ideas or suggestions on that, we can take comments. And also, if anyone has any specific questions then in relation to the presentations, uh, please jump in as well. Donald, thank you. I have specific questions in relation to the presentations. To the accountability group, um, was the idea of independent investigating magistrates as exists in uh, some countries in continental Europe, I know there is a common law system, was that uh, suggested? Second thing is that I gather that on accountability, the IMF 
produced a report on Irish financial procedures or maybe budgetary procedures that uh, it said I think that a high, uh, it was only produced last month, middle of July, said that at a high level apparently some things were okay, but at other levels uh, there was, let's say, a lot left to be desired. And was that mean? Another point to um, the transparency group, uh, Sarah mentioned that there was some dispute about FOI fees. Was it mentioned that in this group that the European Court of Justice, which is an EU institution, apparently found against the government of Romania for charging for uh, FOI requests? Okay, Donald, thanks. Um, and another, do you want to maybe comment on the, on the first question in relation to uh, did we discuss independent? Magistrates as a, as a, as a way of um, investigating. And that's why you investigate, sorry. They were touched on carefully uh, what we really suggested was setting up an independent commission against corruption in order to cover both prevention and enforcement. But the view was expressed that that's unlikely to happen. And that in the meantime, we should maybe look for more honest quotes, including increased interagency cooperation, maybe the setting up of a specialist unit for the um, And then efforts to reduce legal costs um, for, for, for pursuing criminal cases. So that, that was more or less the discussion re re relevant to that point. Um, I might, well, I take the yeah, part, yeah. No, um, in relation to the uh, budget question, we really focused on financial oversight within departments. Um, we knew the budget question would be discussed by the technology group and the um, participation group, so we left it really at that point. No, thanks. In relation to, was it a um, transparency group in relation to the, yes. the government of Romania being fined for charging fees? Yeah, it's been found. Is that far? Yeah. Yeah. Did that come up? Sir, it's uh, no, not my group. Did you want to shed any light on that topic? John Harper. Sorry, sorry, Leo, sorry. Um, no, sorry, I thought I, just, I, just was, I missed the question or I missed the false question. The question was that. The European Court of Justice found the government of Romania to be in contravention of the European uh, Convention of Human Rights and it decided to charge for FOI requests. Was that mentioned in your group during the discussion? Because you did mention that there was some dispute within your group about whether FOI requests should be charged for or not. Um, yeah, it was actually mentioned in the group, that's the point where I was speaking to John about uh, before. Um, for the meeting, actually, which basically just exactly which from Gavin and those meetings. Yeah, um, but I don't, I don't really know what else to say about it other than that. So it wasn't mentioned. It wasn't mentioned specifically in the group, no. But it was, uh, it's been brought up before. So. Perhaps maybe that's, I mean, that's a particularly important piece of information to maybe get a better handle on for for us to get the details. So maybe we could, uh, if Gavin was it uh, who, who raises the last time he seemed familiar with what we said, John. There's a challenge to fees for FOI in principle at the European Court of Justice oh, at the okay. moment. It is about to finish. Um, it would appear that they're about to rule that charging for FOI uh, is a violation of your right to freedom of expression. Okay. Well, that would be obviously hugely significant to the, to the debate on that issue for sure. And it, it may, I mean, it may finish the debate if it's a strong ruling on it or a clear ruling on it. Um, okay, so um, was there any other questions I can say here? Thank you. I just have a question for you. I'm going to do a show of hands, but I wonder how many people are here from outside of Dublin. And um, I thought that was, a, you know, I felt a bit um, that we're not we're misrepresented. There's not enough people here. It's also um, there's new people here. That, you know, so there's no continuity. Well, there's been continuity, but it's going to be very difficult. I think what we mentioned at the beginning was not to try to go too fast, but I feel that that's actually what we're doing. Um, I, I actually would be concerned that an hour and a half to discuss those points and come up with six of those is not enough. I think we should probably give them a full day to doing that. Um, but I'm delighted it's happening. But I would love to know how many people came from outside Dublin. Okay. Um, I mean, this point, first of all, thanks for, for the point. I think the first thing to mention is that I suppose it's a continuous process. So uh, the, the time frame is limited, and we, we acknowledge that there's a, uh, it's not a bush, but there's a limited amount of time to discuss topics on the day. However, it's a process, very lengthy engagement online. We would encourage people to, to do that and it's very much not intended to be decided today, rushed and, and end of story. If you, if you didn't engage today, you, you missed the book. That's not the intention at all. Um, I don't know, John, if you wanted to comment on the issue in relation to the 
holding it at Dublin. And we did we did raise this issue and discuss it the last day, but I'm not sure if you were here. So no, I know I don't mean I have no problem with the houses in Dublin. I just don't know how many people outside of Dublin know about it, and actually came in. Okay. John, did you want to maybe talk about John Davis and his CEO, John um, I, I think you'd want to, to uh, ask Camilla this question uh, as coordinator. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, we're limited by resources, the resources we have, uh, to, to, to roll this consultation out. And um, the, as, as you pointed out, Noel, that much of the consultation can take place online. There's, there's nothing stopping us from reaching out to people from outside Dublin or nothing stopping people from um, coming here other than geography or, or cost and cost is a key factor here for us as well. Okay, thanks John. Anyone else? Um, okay. Um, so again, I would emphasize you know, the issue of the continual engagement online that's where we can really add value to the, to the process so that we don't feel in any shape or form hemmed in by the, the three meetings. And that's important that people do, to, to do that. And so just maybe, does anyone have any comments in relation to the, the initial question that I posed in relation to how do we, how do we ensure our, our continued engagement um, with the process uh, post, even September, post, uh, I don't know if Simon has any, Simon's still here, um, he's gone, is he? Okay, sorry. Um, how, how we do that? Because I mean, there is a risk that we, we see the September the 5th as, a, as some sort of conclusion to the process, or even December as a conclusion to the process when the plan is submitted. Um, and it's important that it doesn't happen. Obviously, it's just a start. I don't know if anyone had any, any comments on that, um, or recommendations, or thoughts. Um, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Just back to the regional, and that was one of the proposals in the participation was the restructuring of local government and to bring it in somewhere along the line that OGP is part of that. And to vote, you know, to do regional discussions on it. Not, you know, I can't really go back to Leach and hold a whole information day on OGP myself. I wouldn't know enough about it, but I would love to be able to tell the people that not everybody's online, so it, it's difficult work. I think we should definitely continue to engage, and I, I feel that through, through local governments, that's the best way to do it. And then we have a task force in each area. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any, anyone else? Any, any comments? Or, I mean, it must be on that topic. Any, any concluding remarks or thoughts as we go through, uh, we come to the end of, of, of today and, and prepare for our next meeting, which is September 5th? Um, yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I just say that um, the, the material that we captured on the index cards and your your things we gave back today, we'll make that available online um, towards the end of next week. Uh, naturally, there there is some crossover um, among the working groups, and some we, we, you know, there may be points that we will merge because definitely the transparency group was talking about stuff that the technology group was talking about. But we really would value your engagement with the online process from here to the fifth. If we're, if we're going to try and um, present stuff to our, to back to ourselves or to to another group on the fifth, um, we, we need to be thinking of uh, smart commitments. So you know, um, I'm happy to feed in um, best practice standards and, and sort of, sort of re the research end of it. But I really ask to get involved in actually shaping shaping the words on the particular outputs of your own group. So be really helpful. Um, if I may, in case I forget later, if I may just thank the volunteers at this stage, um, Peter and Jeannie Ross, Dolores and Robert, I don't have thoughts on them. Um, some of them even came from outside Dublin, I believe, so that's a bonus. I don't know, I, I had stepped out there to speak to Simon, so I don't know whether John mentioned the point, but so it's not getting organised. I think it's something that's um, Legitimately, we ought to be thinking to, to have set some time aside the next meeting as well to think about this crucial period between the report that, uh, that of our wish list that goes into the department and the, the bilateral negotiations or talks that must take place uh, to shape the plan between then and then in December. That's that's really crucial and and that kind of, it does dictate that, that we get our act together as a civil society and citizens. Um, like on the last point, but I know it's an important one. Um, yes, it was on the uh, formulating our priorities. 
Now, the reason why we were proposing a, a voting system to do that, to, to formalize that, is that we're going to have outputs from four different working groups. Everyone's passionate about their own areas, but maybe not, doesn't care about someone else's working group, group suggestions. Um, I think it's worth us reflecting on that between now and the next meeting as well. Um, the, the reason why we're prioritizing it is that the, the, the department sensibly asked us, you know, if you're going to put down your proposal, just tell us what you think are the most important. Maybe we don't agree with that proposition. Maybe we can't arrive at a consensus. You know, maybe we think that to do that in isolation of any other conversation with, with government is meaningless because the top six out of our list of ten could be things that they can't deliver anyway. So I think it's worth reflecting on that between now and the next meeting as well. And you know, giving your feedback on that in a, in a structured way, because that is that is looming on us, and it'll be worth worth getting uh, some of your thoughts together on that. So. Great. No, thanks very much for that. So, I mean, unless there's any further comments that people wish to make, um, we can we can look at that, bringing the meeting to a conclusion. Um, oh, there is comment here. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Just just one quick thing. <coughs> the, well, I really haven't seen anything on OGP outside of. The, the general email forums and so on. Uh, I mean, is it, is it the, there's other media out there, uh, and, and maybe uh, I remember in the UK, the Guardian newspaper got behind a lot of the PSI issues many years ago <coughs> uh, in terms of articles, and is it, uh, you know, so it was like a public system of, of, of people in groups of being made aware of what was going on and, and public sector information. Could, could, could we not look a little bit of, I'm not sure, was it? Group or is it a government that been making a bit more awareness out of in, in national media that this is going on at the moment and might answer some of the questions about outside of Dublin and so on that, that if there's a lot of newspapers and in newspapers and so on that what, what process is going on at the moment that you might get feedback from citizen groups and individuals around the country. It's, it's very low profile at the moment, this is and maybe that's intentional, I don't know. But, but can you broaden it a bit? Yeah, I can, I can ask you maybe do it if you on that. But I think in general, uh, getting national media interest on, on some of these topics is, is, is up a challenge. And there's probably a number of campaigning groups in the country at the moment trying to do that. And it, it is sometimes getting it into the mainstream media can be, can be difficult. But Nuala, maybe have your, your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, uh, we got national media coverage through a piece in the Irish Times. Um, there was a piece in the journal, I think, this day before the first meeting. It was by Mr. Hayes, but he, um, he directed the traffic to us. Um, and so we've got some pick up on that as well, and we've had coverage on um, the political.ie. Um, uh, from the government side of it, the, the, the minister has referenced it in a couple of speeches, but there hasn't been a big, uh, big campaign on that, um, on that side of things. And again, you know, we, we're just limited by capacity. We, we put out press releases and we, you know, got national coverage, but. Um, uh, it, it may, it's not always the sexiest of stories, you know, with, with, with more more interesting news stories out there. It's um, something that is a good thing, <laughs> doesn't always get picked up on, but I, I think it's a really good point. It's really great to get kind of local uh, media coverage and, and, and local radio coverage, you know, it would, it would definitely uh, help from the citizen engagement side of it. Thanks, Lou. Okay, any, any, any further, further questions or, or suggestions or comments before we, uh, before we wrap up today? Yeah. Can I just say before we do it through that um, really, really appreciate everyone attending today and we had a very good attendance on the, back in July and I suppose you know, there was some concern about like, in the middle of August and the holidays uh, this would affect today's uh, discussion and output and, and attendance. It hasn't really so deep appreciation for everyone for, make, for making that effort and contributing so well and we were just against just a, so it's a redoubly effort between now and the 5th of September uh, and as everyone pointed out to, to try and commit to engage uh, with the online process and don't necessarily see it as we're, we're free between now and 5th of September. We're not really. Um, so we'd ask you to fill out the evaluation forms in your pack before you leave. Um, I'd also like to thank our, our, our guest speakers, uh, Peter um, from the Board Institute and Paul and Simon who, who travelled over as well to um, give us their thoughts and I thought they were very, very helpful and informative um, contributions and also our, our, our moderator, Nick Byrne and Big appreciation, of course, goes to the facilitators too. I have to say, there's been a lot of hard work, uh, not just on the day, uh, but on the on the intervening in the, in the periods in, in, uh, between between the, the meetings. So, I um, really appreciate their work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
indeed, and uh, stay calm and look forward to seeing you all and more on the Christmas and